Hello everyone, I am Sarah Hubbard, Grant Training Coordinator for the National Children's Advocacy Center and the host of today's webinar. Thank you for joining today's presentation entitled Outcomes Framework for CACs presented by Sim Doggett. Sim Doggett is the Project Director for the Southern Regional Children's Advocacy Center, a project of the National Children's Advocacy Center funded through a grant from the U.S. Department of Justice, which provides training and technical assistance to children's advocacy centers in 16 states. Ms. Doggett holds a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration and a Master's in Social Work from the University of Alabama. She has also completed the program for senior executives in state and local government at the John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We're shuffling audio around a little bit here. Um, welcome. I, I guess good afternoon to some and good morning to some, depending on where you are. Um, yeah, well, welcome to the Outcomes Framework for CAC's webinar. This collaborative effort between NCAC's training department and the Southern Regional um, Children's Advocacy Center. As you know, um, the Southern Regional Children's Advocacy Center does training and technical assistance for 16 state area in the U.S. and work collaboratively with the other regionals um, in the U.S. And I think more and more we've just heard uh, questions about how do we track outcomes. We've got funders asking for outcome data, and we're not sure what to collect. Um, and as you know, that the work of CACs and MDTs is not a, not a straightforward thing. We're very complex um, organizations, and so it's not particularly easy to really drill down into or to even know where to start to drill down to get outcome data uh, for the work that we do. So we started working on this and trying to figure out how do we do this? How do we capture true outcome data for the work of CACs? Not just like output data, um, not just those inputs and outputs, but really outcomes for the CACs. And that's what we're trying to accomplish with this. Um, so we started, I don't know how many of you took philosophy classes in uh, college. I know I took philosophy 101 thinking that it was going to be an easy A and soon found out that wasn't the case. It turned out to be really a course in logic and how do you deduce one thing from other things. And so we kind of tackled this project with that in mind. You know, how do we logically get to outcomes for the work of CACs? So we started, and again, like Sarah said, I hope that you have all printed out the chart um, it, and I hope that you printed it on large paper. There's a lot of information on that, that sheet of paper, and that's what we're going to be working off of today. We have broken it down kind of into pods, so I think we can get it where it's readable uh, on the screen if you have not printed it out. But if you do have it, it may be easier to follow along with that chart in front of you. Um, so we started, we, did, we said, okay, all right, we want to come up with true outcome measures for CACs. And so what, what is that? What is it that CACs and MDTs are trying to do? And we decided the two major things are to improve child well-being and to improve community and society safety. So all of the work of this framework is built upon those two major goals for the work of CAC. Um, and it, I've thought a lot about that, about is everybody going to agree with that? And I just can't come up with 
not agreeing with that. I mean, I just believe that those are the two major outcomes that we're striving for through our work with CACs and MDTs. Um, again, good outcomes for kids, good outcomes for society. So based on that, if you start with good outcomes for kids, if our overarching measure on good outcomes for kids really is that the consequences of abuse are reduced for children and families, then how do you measure that, right? So on your chart, thank you, Sarah's getting us there. So on your chart, if you look under outcomes for kids, and in the blue, blue box, these are measures that I think point to positive outcomes for kids, that point to the consequences of abuse being reduced for children and families. So let's work, work through these. So I would say one measure would be that the proportion of children and caregivers' resource and support needs are met during service provision. What is that proportion? And one way, I think, to gather that would be that you do the needs assessment um, at intake, which I think we all do. We do that, that basic needs assessment of children and families. And then you can measure that against um, the follow-up contact by your victim advocate or whoever does that follow-up contact down the road. Let me back up and say that, um, that we recognize not everybody would be able to gather all of this information. We totally get that. We totally get that. What this framework is trying to do is to give you some suggested measures that you can capture to show whoever's asking, funders or communities or whoever's asking, how do I know that that's a good investment? How do I know that you're doing good work there? So you can pick and choose these measures um, as you can. And these measures can be used by single CACs. You could capture data which gives you some baseline data, and then down the road, you continue to track that data, and then you can compare how you're doing over time. Or CACs may decide as a, say, a state, um, may decide to pick a few of these measures and track them, and that way you can see how you're doing over time as a state or you can compare yourself to each other. CACs can, can kind of measure yourself against how are, how are we doing, what are our numbers compared to other numbers in the state, or even larger regions can do that. Or you could take this data and compare it, you know, you really could get this data and compare it to communities who don't have children's advocacy centers. I, do think that that's a little problematic and that they may not have the resources or, or the inclination to really track that data. But, but I do think that you can use these measures to assess your own improvement over time or to, as a group, um, to track how you're doing, uh, the group is doing over time or to compare yourself within that group. Um, but again, these are suggested measures. There's, there's nothing that says that you have to collect all of this data. There's nothing even that says you have to collect any of this data, really. But, but if you want to, to come out with true outcome measures, I think you can, can use some of these um, uh, measures to do that. Okay, so back to the, back to the chart. Uh, looking at the positive outcomes for kids. We would say that, that children and caregivers' resource and support needs are met during service provision. And you can do that through your needs assessment at, at intake and follow-up. Also, the children, um, proportion of children and caregivers reporting positive functioning at six months follow-up by victim advocate. So again, you have an assessment up front, how are kids doing when they come in the door, uh, and then 
how are kids functioning six months down the road or whatever time frame you determine. And that can be done by the victim advocate or whoever is making that follow-up contact. But you can, you can um, compare those numbers. Are, are kids improving over time? Also, uh, are children with fiscal concerns receiving medical care? What proportion of children with fiscal concerns are actually receiving medical care? And you may get that from reports from your, your medical provider uh, on how many kids actually are following through with those, those medical exams, or you may get self-reports from children and caregivers on whether they're following through with medical evaluations. You can look at children with trauma symptoms from abuse uh, showing a uh, decrease in symptoms. And that, of course, is just through your standardized pre- and post-trauma assessments that you're already doing, that you're already capturing that data. So this is nothing new. It's just a matter of uh, tracking that data that you're already capturing on symptom reduction. A next measure would be children from uh, are free from abuse by their perpetrators. And so that would just be the number of repeat reports from abuse for children seen at the CAC versus all of the children seen. So how many cases of repeat reports of abuse are you seeing uh, and tracking that over time? So what we've got there, what we're looking at, so outcomes for kids. What we're saying is that the consequences for abuse, uh, of abuse are reduced for children and families, and we're measuring that by looking at are there resource and support needs being met through service provision? Are they, is their functioning increasing over time as they're receiving services? Are the kids uh, with fiscal concerns getting medical care? Are trauma, trauma symptoms for kids being reduced over time? And are kids safe from their perpetrator? Again, you may not be able to track all of these, but I would guess that you're probably already tracking some of this information, and it's just a matter of keeping up with it and then being able to compare that uh, over time. So that's positive outcomes for kids. Then if we look at positive outcomes for community or society. And, and let me stop and encourage you, if, you're, if you do have questions, please be sure to be using the chat box. We'll, we'll circle back around to those questions at the end. And um, try to answer some of those. If we can't get them all answered, then we'll take those questions, we'll compile those questions, and um, get some answers back to you through through email. We have all of your contact information. Isn't that right, Sarah? Yes. <laughs> Very good. Okay. We can find you all. Yeah, yeah. So we'll circle back around to, to your questions. So be sure to, to get those in the chat box. Okay, so th that was, that was uh, some measures that you can look at um, to say, are kids getting better? Um, are we having positive outcomes for kids through the work of the CAC? Next is positive outcomes for community, for your community or for society at large. And our overarching measure would there would be, I think, that perpetrators of abuse are held accountable for their actions and children are protected. I mean, that's what we want for our communities, that that's, you know, part of why we do this job. You know, we always talk about there's two pieces to this, is protecting the child and getting the bad guy. Well, this is the getting the bad guy piece of it. So I think a couple of ways that we could measure that would be uh, looking at the proportion of identified offenders either pleading or convicted of a crime um, against a child versus those that are charged. So really get that from prosecutors' reports of conviction rates 
versus charges pressed. We all know there's reasons why charges may not be pressed, but if you can look at that uh, and compare how many convictions and pleas you're getting versus those charges that are pressed. Um, another measure would be uh, looking at the number of, that the number of offenses by perpetrators are reduced. Um, so we're reducing the number of repeat offenses by the same perpetrators. And that would just come from case tracking systems of CAC or MDT showing reductions in repeat offenders. I mean, you track these you track the perpetrators, so how many times are their names popping back up on your, on your cases? So in, in my mind, that would be, be measures of um, that perpetrators are being held accountable for their actions and that children are being protected from those perpetrators. So we've got those, those two main segments of outcomes that we're we can look at. We've got measures that we can pull and probably already are capturing um, to measure outcomes for kids and outcomes for society. We have tried to stay away again from those um, inputs. Are, are we looking at just uh, whether the agency is, is run well? You know, are the providers getting the training ne they need? But we did feel like that there were some measures that, that really had to be in place for a CAC and an MDT to provide the services for kids and for society for those outcomes to happen. So we've tried to grab those. Again, we've tried to stay away from um, really kind of from the standards, but that, although we're, we are total believers in the standards, but um, but not looking necessarily at the training that people get, but, but what are the processes that have to be in place? <clears throat> and what is the structure that has to be in place for CACs and MDTs to really accomplish the outcomes that we've just talked about for, for children and for uh, communities and society? So if you'll move down on your chart to the quality of intervention, with this, we're really looking at the process that needs to be in place, has to be in place, um, for us to be able to achieve good outcomes. And the overarching measure here is that children and families are receiving trauma-informed, evidence-based services to address their needs and obtain justice. So I think we all kind of agree that that's, that's what we strive to do, is to make sure that that they're receiving trauma-informed evidence-based services. Um, so looking at the, the process of the intervention, one of the measures that I think you can look at would be the proportion of sexual abuse, physical abuse, or other targeted reports, whatever it is that you say you're going to see at the, at the CAC, what is that target population? how many of those are actually being seen at the CAC uh, and, and through the MDT. This is nothing new to you if you already, if you're accredited center, uh, NCA already asked for this information of your um, targeted population, how many actually are being seen at the CAC. So you're already tracking that information. Um, Another measure would be that forensic interviews of children are scheduled within the requested time frame of the investigatory agency. So tracking that, um, you know, when, when law enforcement or CPS calls and says we need an interview, can you track from, from their request how many you're able to do within that requested time frame? And you would compare that to really all the interviews that you do, obviously. So, um, and then again, children with physical concerns are accessing medical services by trained child abuse medical providers. I think we all agree that this is a, a major concern and 
um, really feeds into whether kids are getting quality services. So some of the tools that you can use to assess that would be comparing the number of medical referrals made versus the number of interviews conducted. And I can hear some of you already, although I can't really hear anything. <laughs> I, I know some of you are saying, I know, yeah, but we don't refer all kids for medicals. And that's, you know, that's what you've decided. But I think you can track, and it, and it would be helpful to track, how many interviews you're doing, and of those, how many medical referrals are you making? Uh, a next assessment tool would be the number of cases seen by tra trained child abuse medical professionals versus all referred cases. So of the cases that you refer for medicals, how many are being seen by a trained child abuse medical professional? You know, and the standards, um, NCA standards define that. So looking at that definition of a tra trained child abuse medical professional, how many of your referred cases are being seen by, by a trained professional as opposed to just any medical professional? And then another assessment tool regarding that would be the number of referrals actually showing for an initial medical exam versus the number of referrals made. So. Of all of those medical referrals that you make, how many are actually showing up for that medical exam? Um, that's not as much of an issue within, uh, if you've got on-site medical care, you kind of know, and most of the time they do show up for that because it's just down the hall. But if you're doing this through a linkage agreement, we, I, we do have some people who kind of fall off the radar between the CAC and the provider's office. So how many are actually showing for the medical exam versus the number of referrals? And then another measure on the intervention, uh, the, sort of the process, would be that children with trauma symptoms are accessing evidence-based mental health services. So that's kind of similar to your the medical service, but now we're talking about mental health services. So you would be comparing the number of mental health referrals made versus the number of interviews conducted. So again, very similar to the, the medical, of all the interviews conducted, of, of those, how many mental health referrals are being made? And then another uh, measure on the mental health piece, services piece, would be the report of the mental health provider regarding follow-through of the child and caregiver in initial shows for service versus number of referrals. So of the referrals, how many actually showed up for that initial um, consultation with a the therapist? And then of those that go, and, and you can get this from the mental health provider, how many are being provided with ongoing services? Um, yeah, of those kids that have trauma symptoms, how many are receiving ongoing services? And again, you're, you, you know, you're gonna have some kids who aren't showing, aren't symptomatic, aren't showing um, trauma symptoms, but of those with trauma symptoms, how many are receiving ongoing services? Next would be um, on just the, the quality of the intervention. Identified offenders are charged with a crime. So this would be the number of cases with charges pressed versus the number of, case, of cases of confirmed abuse. So the team has said, yes, we think this is, this is abuse. And then the, how, uh, how many of those cases are actually being charged? Um, now, again, we know there's lots of reasons not to charge, but I think it's, in, it's um, an important measure to know how many are being charged when, when the team is saying this is confirmed abuse. Um, you know, it certainly may be implications for, for um, the work. And then 
children and caregivers reporting satisfactory experiences with CACMDT during the investigation and service provision. For those of you who are doing OMS, uh, you're already tracking this. You're gathering that through the satisfaction surveys through OMS. Um, so just tracking that over time, I think, helps keep you on track. Again, I, I'm not sure that it, it is directly an, um, an outcome, but it does shore up the work um, that leads to those positive outcomes for kids and positive outcomes for community and society. So that's, that's looking at the quality of the work that we're doing, the quality of the interventions, the processes that we have in place that are supporting those uh, outcomes for kids, that we're reducing the consequences of abuse for children and families, and that perpetrators are being held accountable. So that's the intervention that's supporting it. We also want to look at the structure. What do we have a structure in place that supports those positive outcomes? Um, and in doing that, uh, you know, the basis for this work is that we're we're doing it with a coordinated, collaborative MDT approach. That investigations and interventions are happen happening in a coordinated way. So. How do we look at the measures of that structure? I think one way would be to look at our protocols. Does the CAC and MDT have documented uh, procedures and plans to guide the work of the professionals? So do we have appropriate protocols in place that guide that work? And living documents, you know, not just something out there. And you, you all have protocols. Are, are those really guiding the work of the professionals? Do we have those written documentations? Um, also, does if there is a CAC, because I think you can use these measures for MDTs too, if there's not a CAC in place in your community, I do think MDTs can take these, or, or pick and choose from these measures to help assess their own outcomes for kids and for society, even without a, a CAC being in place. But if there is a CAC in place, then is there a current strategic plan that actively guides the work of the CAC? Um, I think that that's an important piece of that structure that to really support positive outcomes for kids and families. Then another measure on the organization or, or the structure, if, if you will, would be the proportion of interviews occurring with all investigatory agencies involved. If we're saying that this model is based upon coordinated collaborative work, then, then we need to be measuring, are the investigatory agencies really involved in those interviews? Um, and so I mean, that's pretty straightforward. The number of interviews of target case children with all the agencies involved, the investigatory agencies involved, versus the number of interviews of target case children. So of, the, all, of all the interviews, how many have all of the investigatory agencies there, or, in, or at least involved in the interviews? Um, Another measure would be the proportion of interviews and investigations occurring according to protocol. These last two get a little, a little harder to track, but I can envision um, a, maybe a checklist of major points within your protocols to help you determine whether um, interviews and investigations are really happening according to the procedures that you put in place in your protocol, you know, and, and it wouldn't be every little little piece of it, but are the major players uh, really following the protocol and are those cases being processed the way your protocol says it, it should? And then tracking that over time versus the all of the um, investigations and interviews that happen. 
And then the last one would be the proportion of service coordination with all partners involved. So in the previous measure, we were looking at interviews and the investigation. So this is just its, its kind of co-part of service provision or all of the um, partners having some input into service provision for the child and caregiver. Are they providing that input and having the opportunity to do so? And again, that may be a checklist. That may be uh, some way of reviewing that um, at the end of case review or, or for each case. Um, so again, this framework is meant to provide some suggestions to really help us wrap our head around what is it that we need to measure to show that we're actually having positive outcomes from CAC. And in my mind, that means are we reducing uh, the consequences of abuse for children and families? And are we holding perpetrators accountable? And the framework provides some suggested measures that you can take on either individually within your CAC or within, within a group um, of CACs uh, to really look at how you're doing over time and to provide some real data for for funders and for others who are asking um, for that data. 